Sometimes one movie does such a great job at showcasing its genre that it becomes the quintessential poster child for the genre itself. For the buddy cop genre, Lethal Weapon is just that. Hell, it might be the best buddy movie in general, though that is an argument that I am actively choosing not to make. Instead, let's keep our focus narrowed to just one truth, which is that Lethal Weapon is the best buddy cop movie ever made and the peak of the genre. My name is Cole. I like movies. Let's talk. Lethal Weapon was released in 1987 and quickly became not only a fan favorite, but a monetary success as well. Per IMDb, the movie had a budget of $15 million and grossed $120 million worldwide. Now using Matt Damon's rule of marketing a movie, we can safely assume that they spent roughly $30 million marketing it. That would mean that the movie made $75 million. Not bad at all. In fact, it did well enough that to date, there are four Lethal Weapon movies and there was even a three season television series that came out in 2016. In fact, rumors are constantly swirling that there might be a fifth movie in the works sometime down the line. Now, how do I feel about that? Hard to say. The movie tells the story of two cops who are suddenly partnered with one another with neither being particularly happy about the arrangement. Danny Glover plays Robert Murtaugh, a kind-hearted family man who has just turned 50 years old. His new partner is Martin Riggs, played by Mel Gibson, who is a wild, reckless, and suicidal younger detective who has been reassigned as a result of his antics. The two characters do not particularly care for one another from the beginning as they get off on the wrong foot from the jump, with Murtaugh tackling Riggs to the ground inside of the precinct as he mistakes Riggs for a citizen or a criminal brandishing a weapon inside the precinct. After a few smaller cases and scenes they are called to, Murtaugh begins to see the depths of the manicness that bubbles just below the surface of Riggs, which causes him to fear that Riggs will end up getting him killed. This is one of the quintessential elements at play within a buddy film. We have two people who start the tale either indifferent or entirely opposed to one another who, through a series of events, are forced to come together and learn to get along. There are many great examples of buddy cop films, with the 80s being the peak of it in a lot of ways. For the record, Turner and Hooch, which came out in 1989 and starred Tom Hanks alongside a dog as his partner, is also a buddy cop movie. What makes this movie so special are three key things. The writing, the acting slash directing, and the cinematography. Duh. Let's talk about the writing of the movie. For the sake of not giving away the entirety of the film, as well as brevity, we will examine the first 20 minutes of the movie. After the opening credits, we see a young woman who then leaps from a building to her death, immediately showing the audience the gravity that the film possesses. We then meet Roger and his family as he is being given a surprise cake while taking a bath to celebrate his birthday, immediately showing us a great deal about who Roger is. His oldest daughter mentions it being his 50th and gives him a kiss before leaving Roger to stew in his aging. This is done perfectly as we learn his age and his lamenting of it while not being told it in a way that feels forced. The conversation feels natural and is the perfect way to quickly summarize this. We then cut to a beach where we find Martin Riggs living in a camper laying on his bed and smoking a cigarette with his pistol beside his head. He stumbles out, feeds his dog, which signals to the audience that he is a decent and caring man, albeit flawed, and then makes his way over to the fridge to crack open a beer. We know so much about these characters so quickly. When we get back to Roger, we have one of the first inciting incidents of the plot subtly shown to us when his wife tells him that an old friend of his has called for him several times. We also see the sweet-hearted, kind, and loving banter between him and his wife, reinforcing our image of Roger being the caring husband and father figure that he is. We also learn that Roger is a veteran of the Vietnam War in this scene, with the scene ending with yet another reminder that he is aging when he sees his oldest daughter in her New Year's Eve dress. We follow Roger to the crime scene of the girl who fell from the roof in the opening shots, where we meet a prostitute named Dixie who will become an important character in the film. We find out that the girl who jumped is the daughter of the friend who had been calling for Roger for the past few days. All of this is told to us through dialogue that feels grounded in reality and helps to flush out the character more fully. This can be seen in the way that Roger takes the news that the girl is his friend's daughter and the way he is so clearly distraught about it when he calls his wife to get the friend's number. Next, we meet Riggs in a drug-busting undercover operation where things get hairy. Through this, we see just how crazy he is and his willingness to die at any time. Afterwards, we follow him back to his camper, where he is drinking and half-watching television while crying and staring at a picture of him and his wife on their wedding day. He unloads his pistol, places a singular hollow point round into the chamber, stares into the barrel for a moment, places it onto his forehead, then into his mouth, presses his thumb onto the trigger and attempts to will himself to pull it. He pulls it out at seemingly the last possible moment, cries to himself, 
rubs the picture onto his face and talks about how he misses her. Through this scene, we understand Riggs fully in a way that feels realistic. It doesn't feel like what we have just seen is simply being done for the sake of the movie, but rather feels like we have taken a step into what we can only assume is a pretty regular night for the suicidal widower, Martin Riggs. Through these 20 minutes, we can see the efficiency and proficiency with which Lethal Weapon was written. One of the things that allows the writing to feel so precise, thoughtful, and balanced is that it was written by only two screenwriters rather than an entire writing group. Though these two writers also happen to be two of the great screenwriters, Shane Black and Jeffrey Bohm. For those unaware, Shane Black also wrote The Monster Squad, Last Action Hero, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, and one of my favorite movies of recent times, The Nice Guys. Needless to say, Shane Black is no slouch when it comes to writing lovable, tragic figures and huge, interesting action films with a noir vibe. Jeffrey Bohm also wrote Straight Time, The Lost Boys, Indiana Jones, and The Last Crusade. While his list of writing credits is smaller, he is no slouch, and together they crafted an absolute masterpiece within the buddy cop genre. Now, let's talk about the director of the film, the great Richard Donner. Richard Donner is by no means an average director. He has been a part of some of the biggest productions of all time, even if you don't currently know his name. Like a lot of directors of his era, he got his start in television. Some notable moments in his tenure on television would include seven episodes of The Rifleman, six episodes of The Twilight Zone, and four episodes of The Man from UNCLE. His film debut came when he directed a movie that you probably don't remember called Salt and Pepper, starring Sammy Davis Jr. and Peter Lawford in, yes, a buddy cop movie meaning that in 1968, Richard Donner found a genre that he would absolutely own. He then directed a weird film that could absolutely never be made today about a 38-year-old porn writer who marries a 16-year-old British schoolgirl. It's called London Affair, though its original title was Twinkie. This doesn't matter much to our story, but I couldn't not mention it when I came across it on his IMDb page. He continued to direct television in the occasional movie until his career changed forever in 1975 when he directed The Omen. The following year, he directed Superman, and by the end of his career, when he directed his last film in 2006, he had directed some truly huge films, including Superman 2, The Goonies, All Four Lethal Weapons, Scrooged, Assassins, and 16 Blocks. While not a name everyone and their mother knows, like Tarantino, Scorsese, or Spielberg, he was a very good, if not great, director who absolutely knew how to make a fun action film that both packed a punch as well as made you think and feel along the way. Let's quickly talk about the two main actors in the film, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. Danny Glover delivers a great performance as Roger Murtaugh. Well, except for the scene where he raps for his family. That's pretty... Yeah. Speaking of which, notice how we don't actually see him rap. I'm going to find a father because my name is Roger. And I need to be and a and a it cuts away and we hear it, but I can't help wonder why this is. Did he refuse to do this or was he so embarrassed by it that he refused to have his face seen while doing it? I have so many questions and I don't know if I'll ever get an answer about this. So congratulations on the bars that you now have stuck in your head thanks to Sergeant Murtaugh. <laughs> Other than all that, he delivers a grounded, perfect performance throughout the film, including his iconic catchphrase that he repeats throughout the film on several occasions. Oh, I'm too old for this shit. Mel Gibson delivers a truly incredible performance as Martin Riggs. He is tasked with showing so much in this film and absolutely delivers. He is able to express so much with his face and it shows a great range of emotions. I cannot think of any actor of that era who would have done a better job of completing the assignment. And I think there's a real argument to be made that this is perhaps Mel Gibson's finest work as an actor. Sorry Braveheart, but Riggs is better. In addition to the main duo, one of the major villains of the film is played by the ever enigmatic Gary Busey, who does an incredible job of playing an absolute psychopath of a man. You can't look away from him every time he is on the screen, and he fills the viewer with tension and terror. He is absolutely amazing in this movie, and I don't think he gets enough credit for it when his career is discussed. The cinematography of this film is incredible. From the lighting to the color choices to the shots themselves, they all work incredibly well. The whole film just feels cinematic, right from the opening sequences all the way through to the ending. The director of photography on the film is Steven Goldblatt. 
He was also the DP on The Pelican Brief, Batman Forever, Rent, Charlie Wilson's War, The Help, and many others, and is one of the great cinematographers from the late 70s through to the present. Let's talk about some things that are working in favor of Lethal Weapon, as well as some things working against it. There are many things that Lethal Weapon does incredibly well. The story is incredibly well told, and the characters feel three-dimensional, interesting, and to put it simply, real. The actors do fantastic jobs, especially Mel Gibson and Gary Busey. Now, I don't say that to slight Danny Glover in any way, but his role is the easiest of the three to play realistically. The director clearly did an excellent job of getting the most out of the actors that he had and should absolutely receive his much-deserved flowers for this. The movie is shot incredibly well, with perfectly executed big shots that feel cinematic all the way from the shot composition to the lighting and perfect use of shadow. The movie is not only a perfect action movie, but also the best buddy cop movie ever made. There are a few things slightly working against Lethal Weapon, but all of them are really the result of the time in which the film was made and I feel should not prevent anyone from watching and enjoying the movie. The film is absolutely a part of its time in many ways as it completely and utterly oozes mid to late 80s. The movie is about them chasing after drug dealers, which is a common thing during movies that came out during the peak of Reagan's war on drugs and their saxophone all over this movie. The characters also use some slurs from time to time, though it's not too frequent, especially when compared to some contemporary films of its era, especially in the action scene. Lethal Weapon is quite possibly my favorite action film ever made. I've watched it countless times and have seen all of the sequels as well. Honestly, they're not as bad as you might think. To my recollection, I believe I once stated that the third is actually better than the second, though I'd have to re-watch them to see if that still holds true. You should absolutely watch Lethal Weapon if you haven't already, as the film is utterly captivating and Mel Gibson's performance is incredible. The movie absolutely holds up. Let me know what you think about Lethal Weapon in the comments below, and let me know if you would like to see a retrospective on the whole series, which is something that I have been considering doing. And stay tuned for next week when we...